Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Michelle Sante Willis, Associate Dean for Medical Education Administration, and I'm your moderator for today's Subway Summit session. I hope you all have had the opportunity to join in other sessions this week. Our colleagues throughout New York City have shared, and the metro area, have shared their experiences, insights, and through the lenses of curriculum, diversity and inclusion, student affairs, wellness, regulatory affairs, and the student role in supporting our care environment. Today, we will focus on what resources were needed and how we mobilized our teams into action during the worst public health crisis in this last century. I'm telling you, just saying that right now still makes my stomach flutter. In addition to our work, many of us battled the illness, cared for loved ones with the virus, and lost many who were dear to us from the ravages of COVID-19. We must remember that it's not just the process, but it was the people that were impacted by this pandemic. And we will share this memory with each other for the rest of our lives. We're starting off each session this week with a welcome video and a montage from leaders of different institutions sharing their first impression as it became clear that New York City was to be the primary epicenter of this pandemic in the United States of America. Hi, and welcome to the Subway Summit webinar series. My name is Tara Cunningham, and I'm the Senior Associate Dean for Student Affairs at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. And the medical schools in our region have been at the epicenter of the worst pandemic our country has ever faced. We have learned many hard-won lessons, and among them, the importance of finding ways to make the best of a very bad situation and to transform disruption caused by COVID-19 into disruptive innovation. We hope this summit is a contribution in that vein and that our ability to share how we've responded and what we've learned help our colleagues across the country, all of whom are facing COVID-19 challenges, some of which are universal and others that are unique to each of our institution. This series is made possible from the contribution of New York and New Jersey medical schools. Each will share lessons learned from surge and post-surge recovery strategies and contingency planning with the lens of diversity, equity and inclusion, communication strategies, and infection prevention. Lastly, I would like to thank the colleagues across these participating institutions and the team at the Icon School of Medicine that have made this webinar series possible. Your contribution, collaboration, compassion, kindness, and laughter have been absolutely needed in these last three months and all the more moving us forward. A special thank you to Jeff Young at the Association of American Medical Colleges, the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation, and the Associated Medical Schools of New York for supporting this effort. On behalf of everyone, we hope you enjoy the Subway Summit webinar series, COVID-19 Lessons Learned from the Epicenter. had thought a lot about a time when I was at University of Maryland. I had just arrived home after five years in Bangladesh. And although I intellectually knew how much the HIV epidemic had changed uh, during the five years I was gone, I wasn't prepared for seeing that and realizing how high a percentage of all of the children in the pediatric wards at University of Maryland were in fact infected with HIV. 
it would be several more years before the clinical trials would be finished up in 1994 that demonstrated that perinatal transmission could be dramatically reduced, um, about a 70% reduction. Um, and so at this time, up anywhere between a third and almost a half of infants born to mothers who were HIV positive were themselves HIV positive. And then I was at a meeting, and that was really the the moment that I remember when, when I heard, thought about the pandemic coming. And the purpose of the meeting um, was with the hospital senior authorities trying to decide whether they should build another facility to be taken care of just HIV positive children. And I, I had this thought of, in some ways, that's what our hospitals will, will look like while COVID-19 is here. Obviously, the two are very different because COVID-19 would come in waves, whereas HIV infection was chronic. But nonetheless, the dramatic impact on a profession and on our whole way of, of approaching how we take care of children. The other thought that I had um, was the recognition that this now was transforming the way our students would think about their medical education career and indeed in some ways probably the way that they would practice medicine for the rest of their lives. Uh, I had not realized um, at the point that I first learned I realized that the pandemic was coming that our students would have to come off the wards. That actually had never even entered my mind. And that in of itself, of course, was a fundamental impact on the educational process. Not necessarily in a bad way, it was necessary um, because we didn't have enough equipment to be able to have them remain safe and our other first line responders be safe. And you know, we made the most of it as did medical schools around the whole country but certainly a very different approach uh, to anything that, that I had witnessed up to date. Thank you. Before we start this session, it's important that we take a few moments to talk about what's really been going on in the world around us. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on black and brown communities across the country. The violence that COVID-19 has done to communities of color, how different is it really than the violence that we're seeing on the streets in Louisville, Kentucky, in Minneapolis, and in Southern Georgia. It is really part and parcel of the long history of violence in America against people of color. It is part of our legacy. And it is another sad piece of evidence that systemic racism leads to the unspeakable loss of life and is our nation's fatal flaw. We're glad that you are all here with us today. We're being intentional each day to offer all of you attendees the opportunity to share and connect. The webinar platform, as I just described, is not very interactive. So we wanna connect with you as much as possible during our time together. Please go to slido.com as you've done and share one word about what's giving you hope these days. Really um, what is beautiful is that the word cloud allows us to bring to the forefront the sentiment of the audience so that we know what's going on. Uh, community, students, compassion, resilience, science, exhausted. I think many of us can share the sentiments and many of us feel uh, some of the same things. Um, friends, trust, thank you so much. Before we start our session, I would like to encourage you all to join us for a newly added session of our Subway Summit. Uh, the session is on tomorrow, entitled Racism, American Medicine's Fatal Flaw. This session was added specifically to encourage dialogue after the murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, and countless others. Our nation is responding to these events, and we believe that our colleagues in academic medicine have a call to action as well. These are our friends and colleagues who join us uh, at, for the Subway Summit and who shared their time and energy and who participated in the care of our, of our communities and our neighbors as we rallied through this entire region, um, the ravages of this pandemic. We would also like to thank the Josiah Macy Foundation for supporting our work. And finally, I would like to thank Drs. Tara Cunningham and Leona Hess 
whose ingenuity and creativity made this all possible. Thank you and thank you all again. So uh, these are the objectives of our seminar series. If you're interested in CME credits, you must be registered for the event in order to receive uh, your CME credits. The title for today's session is Operations, People, Money, Space, and Resource Allocation from the Epicenter of a Pandemic. The partners joining me today for this seminar series include Carol Bates, from uh, Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell, Todd Cassis from Einstein College of Medicine, Joe Giovanelli from Columbia University Vagilos College of Physicians and Surgeons, myself, Michelle Sante Willis, Senior Associate Dean for Medical Education Administration, and Anurag Shavastava, Assistant Dean uh, at uh, Einstein College of Medicine. Today's session will be a roundtable discussion, which brings together administrative and curricular leaders from all around this region to discuss lessons learned, strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities that arose during the COVID-19 response and recovery planning. We'll speak for about an hour, and then we'll allow about a half an hour for questions and answers from you, you the attendees. We're encouraging you to submit your questions as they come to mind. We will answer your questions at the end of the discussion and hope to have additional pearls to share based on your witness, on your interests. The system allows for you to upvote by clicking the thumbs up. This way we will be able to see which questions reflect the interest of the audience, thereby minimizing duplicated questions. So as part of this process, we realized that many of us had lots of things in common. We shared lots of commonality. And there were many things that were really particular to the institutions and the cultures that we came from. Many things that we shared in common included uh, graduating students, our fourth year students early, to help work in the hospitals through the surge, um, stopping all on campus and off and um, activities for students, faculty, and staff the creation of remote learning environments, working arrangements, and telehealth operations. And then as part of the recovery planning, reintegrating students into the learning environment, bringing back faculty and staff, deciding whether or not all of these things are contingent on the moment and we're planning for now and, and the short term, or are we going to change how we do business and how we teach in the future? Carol, will you start us off? Absolutely. Um, hi, everyone. Um, first of all, I just want to say that I am honored and happy to be here today with my esteemed colleagues um, and very excited to share our experiences at the Zucker School of Medicine. So the question is, um, what was the structure of the response teams at each school? And um, to share what we did at the Zucker School of Medicine, our initial planning team was formed in early March as we began strategizing around a possible university closure. And this team included our Dean and Vice Dean, our three undergraduate medical, medical education deans, our GME Dean and our Student Affairs Dean, our Chair of Science Education who oversees our full-time teaching faculty, and myself. Uh, several members of this team were simultaneously involved in Northwell Health's planning efforts and other members of our team were simultaneously involved in Hofstra University's planning efforts to help ensure alignment across the two institutions because the Zucker School of Medicine sits right in the middle of the two, being an equal partnership between Hofstra University and Northwell Health. This initial response team I just described met several times per week, sometimes multiple times per day in the two weeks leading up to the closure of Hofstra's campus after which our meetings started to taper off to three times a week. Um, we're continuing to meet to this day about once per week. Under the, th the three UME deans, the curriculum team formed its own response teams, really consisting of multiple teams working on the redesigning of the delivery of our curriculum, both within our first and second years and within our third and fourth years. In more recent weeks, we added additional structure to and broadened the planning efforts of our original response team. So where our original response team consisted of nine senior leaders 
Now this team makes up our executive team and we have formed subcommittees comprised of many more faculty and staff representatives to address planning in five specific areas, student life, academics, communication, human resources, and facilities. And lastly, a planning committee of students has also recently been created to help weigh in on our planning efforts as we move towards reopening our medical education building. And I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Einstein team. Thank you, Carol. So uh, if you can hear me, this is a, a very busy slide purposefully. Uh, this is not meant to show what one should do. Uh, or what what one can do, but it's to show that this is complicated. Uh, the systems that we're using uh, are very, very challenging because there's many of them. And many of these, really the point of this is that uh, these are already existing uh, structures and leveraging the existing structures that you have is really critical. So I'm not gonna go through this by any means, but just to give you a sense of what these icons stand for, People communicate by phone, by Epic in our system, um, by cloud-based systems, by email, by text message, by Twitter. There's really a million ways that all of these groups speak. This existing structure is what we use and leverage when we ramped up. So to back up a little bit more, um, our institution is in the Bronx, if you're not familiar with New York City, sort of the northern borough, and we're a fairly large healthcare provider within that borough. Uh, and got hit fairly hard and fairly quick with our surge, much like uh, all of our colleagues here. So we went to give you a sense of the scope from you know zero patients up to four figures of patients in just a matter of a few weeks. So we didn't have time to create a structure. So as those of you who are listening are thinking about what a surge could look like in your communities, I would recommend looking at your existing structures first and understanding how they communicate and then going from there to the next step. So the lesson learned here uh, for Einstein was we really wanted to, uh, where we really had to leverage the systems that we already had in place. Uh, and if we can go to the next slide, please. So the part that we care about the most, and you know, my role of this is more on the GME side than the UME side, but I, I link uh, with my colleague, Dr. Cassis will speak next. So on the upper right here, you see, um, the UME side, and I'll let Dr. Cassie speak more to this, but we had medical school volunteers. We had the early graduates, as Michelle mentioned at the beginning, like other institutions. And we interfaced those graduates with our graduate medical education team on the left side of the slide here. And we primarily dealt with the non-internal medicine program directors, and within which there's ophthalmology, radiology, radiation oncology, et cetera, about 12 departments. And then we also dealt with PAs, nurse practitioners, and then faculty as well that were deployed and we deployed all of those people to the various um, centers that you see at the bottom, the surgical floors, emergency rooms, and testing centers. So our structure uh, was kind of built on the fly. And as I said, just to bring this point home, leveraging your existing systems is really the most efficient and effective way because you're not only leveraging what exists in terms of the structures, but you also probably have communications built into the system already. With that, I'll, I'll uh, hand over to Dr. Cassis. Thanks, Anurag. Uh, one of the things that I think was really uh, unique about our institution is that we do have, uh, we do have um, uh, a different set of uh, leadership and organization for our health set system than we do for our medical school. And I think it was critical that we have uh, open and, and frequent communication with our uh, folks in GME and the health system, and that ended up working out incredibly well uh, during this process. And um, what I'll talk more about is our medical school operations, which is our graduate school medical education uh, infrastructure. And we really took advantage of existing structures that were in place already, and then made several new ones to uh, really accommodate for changing needs. So the existing structure I'm most excited to talk about was when we first realized we needed an emergency operations uh, group, we actually leveraged an existing snow day team. Snow day team was really put in place to deal with inclement weather and whether we should keep the university open for business as usual or, or not have that happen. And that group already um, it was made up of all the individuals that were relevant when we had to deal with issues surrounding uh, COVID-19. The group itself, I'll just read off a little bit, it was made up of our dean, executive dean, uh, facilities, uh, finance, legal group, our IT group, our offices of medical education and student affairs, our graduate school leadership, our communications team, uh, housekeeping, security, transportation, our housing unit, occupational health, environmental health, 
purchasing, clinical research, basic research, and the list goes on. It was a big group, but that group met twice a week uh, through most of this pandemic, and it really was a great sounding board for big decisions that we were making. Um, we had a subgroup of that that was made up of our offices of medical education, student affairs, and registrar, and that group met twice a week for the duration. It's now meeting about twice a week, um, and the goal uh, for that group was really to make major changes in curriculum uh, and really have unity around uh, and consensus around how many of these changes that had to be made on the fly uh, would be viewed, would be perceived, and could be implemented. Uh, we also were really fortunate, I want to mention another really great innovation that we had. We have a phenomenal division of infectious diseases in our internal medicine department. And that division made a, a key decision early on to uh, really assign one infectious disease uh, faculty member to many of our important committees. And so they had representation on that broader snow day committee as well as in our, uh, our Office of Medical Education Student Affairs group. And this allowed for us to get real time information, uh, really someone who was expert in thinking about the changes we were experiencing on the infectious disease side. And the last one I'll mention is that initially my, uh, my area of the office was overseeing our student volunteer efforts to make sure they were safe, that students were being supervised. And I was thrilled when I finally was able to identify phenomenal student leadership uh, to take on some of that, that workflow. And they did an amazing job really coordinating the efforts of our students and I'll, I'll stop there. Todd. Joe? Great. Hi, I just wanted to thank Michelle and the uh, folks at Mount Sinai for helping to put this together. So uh, I'm with uh, Columbia, the Vangelos College of Physicians and Surgeons, and uh, I am responsible for administration finance within the education group. So our group is focused um, uh, pretty much entirely on uh, medical students and um, uh, uh, the organizational issues that I'm going to talk about have to do with education. Um, we immediately decided to expand the sort of, again, uh, building on the logic of utilizing structures that were in place um, to expand on a cabinet model of uh, the associate deans responsible for each of the functions within education, financial aid, admissions, student affairs, report to a vice dean for education. We expanded that cabinet to include a number of director level staff and moved to daily half hour meetings. So every morning we meet as a group and we basically go around the room uh, 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 allowing everyone uh, to give the whole group uh, updated information. Um, the, it's been very helpful and useful uh, because it's uh, on the one hand wide ranging, uh, everyone involved in student education is there, but on the other hand, we were able to keep it short and limited and then do follow up later on. Um, within medical education, each of those respective departments um, were asked to organize their staff in whatever uh, way made the most sense. Uh, in some cases, daily meetings, in other cases, a little less, uh, a little less frequently. And uh, again, to bring information and concerns to that main driving meeting uh, every day. Outside of education, there are of course other groups and um, the areas of the medical school that are responsible for uh, clinical services, the, the practice plan, uh, and research each had similar parallel organizations uh, for uh, administration of those areas. The Vice Dean for Finance and Administration meets uh, at first biweekly and later weekly with all of the respective departmental administrators and representatives from areas like education that sit outside of the traditional academic departments um, to compare information at the, uh, at the medical uh, uh, center level. It includes um, representatives from the School of Nursing and Dentistry. So that's a very uh, broadly based group. And that has continued to meet, as I said, weekly. Um, so again, I think the lessons are build on existing structures that you have. Later on, we're gonna talk some more about communication, but obviously communication across and within these groups is key and um, uh, uh, you know, follow up on everything, uh, either through email or phone calls um, after these groups and, uh, uh, and, and standing meetings identify key, key issues. Thanks, Joe. 
Here at Icon School of Medicine, uh, we assembled what we called the Education COVID-19 Response Team. Uh, we created a listserv and used this conduit to send all communications to the departments and the students related to uh, the education response at that time. We met twice a day every day for the first two months. We now meet once a day for three out of five days and twice a day for the other two. The COVID response team was comprised of the Dean for Medical Education, all of our senior associate dean staff, uh, curricular affairs, student affairs, myself, admissions, um, who is uh, our admissions dean is also an infectious disease doc. So we had infection prevention embedded in our system, in our response team. Associate deans for UME affairs, clinical competence, diversity and inclusion, the grad school, the MD PhD program, and our enrollment services program directors uh, of the Student Health Center and our electives directors as well, and our clinical project management team. We collated a timeline and tracked policies, guidelines and protocols for archiving and LCME policy review whenever required. We also had to be mindful of the LCME CQI process that was really running parallel. We had just come off the heels of um, uh, receiving our feedback from the LCME. So we had to be cognizant of those concerns as we were developing our plan. We also had uh, our students mobilized and many of you were on for the student session yesterday. They mobilized a COVID response task force. They, had, uh, they started with their representatives on student council who are part of the disaster preparedness and emergency management teams. And then they also brought in the leadership of student council and created work groups for morale, PPE, IT and telehealth, and supply chain. So we had two very robust systems in response, mobilizing all of the folks who are responsible for the administration, teaching, and environment, as well as the students. Uh, Einstein team? Yes, thank you, Michelle. So the next question uh, that we're going to discuss, um, given the structure, how did you assess the needs of the environment in the moment as we we're managing the crises and then for the return to this new environment? There's, there's a lot that can be spoken about, and so I'm going to keep my, my comments fairly brief and allow everyone else to, to add to it. Um, so I'll break it up into two parts, uh, the way I'll answer. One is how do we manage patient flow? So information is really key during a crisis like this because we're talking about bringing patients from our community into our emergency room, generally speaking, or a transfer from a, a, another university or one of our affiliates into our system. And there's a lot of patients here. We're talking about uh, you know hundreds to uh, you know thousands of people at one point coming in over the course of weeks. So command centers are really critical. Um, we did needs assessments daily, and we still get two to three reports a day on our census, our bed boards, admissions, um, critical care. Uh, obviously, the number of ventilators was in the news quite a bit uh, in the country of New York City and, and our institution and beyond. How many ventilators do we have? We had to switch many of our operating rooms and use the anesthesia machines. And all of this happened in real time as patients were flowing in. So monitoring patient flow was really critical and having uh, very detailed analytics. We had statisticians. Uh, we happened to be consulting with McKinsey at the time. So they happened to be on board and did a lot of our predictive modeling at the same time. Uh, so it was really all hands on deck and trying to understand what not only the next week would look like, but what would the next two or three hours look like? And that was really a critical thing. Uh, the next thing I want to mention more on the medical education or resident perspective is how do we check in on our trainees? Uh, so we had a pretty robust system with our GME department and our, our uh, Office of Medical Education Student Affairs that existed, and we leveraged a lot of those relationships. We talked to the program directors, uh, you know, three to four times per day who were reaching out to the students. We had a cloud-based system that allowed communications in both directions to see if people were getting sick and what we needed to do about that. We had a very robust um, caregiver support network that was created in multiple uh, offices, which would allow us to uh, have real-time conversations with our, with our uh, residents and house staff and um, medical students and, and others. So um, lots of things come up quickly. Uh, and the key is just to sort of stay on top of it and plan ahead for as much as you can. Uh, Dr. Cassis, I'll let you go for a minute. Thanks, Anurag. Uh, so I think in terms of the medical school side, I'll just mention that uh, I'm an internal medicine doc. I do hospital medicine by, by uh, vocation. And I split my time during the, the pandemic taking care of patients at Montefiore Medical Center 
and then working in the Office of Education. So I was thinking clinically. And a lot of what we were trying to do is take the pulse of our communities and different members of our communities uh, throughout this time frame. And that was challenging. I don't think we always did it perfectly, and I, I'd be the first to admit that. Um, but in thinking about our students, the main ways that we were able to do that was to actually leverage um, existing student representatives uh, for different classes. And they were able to really um, get us accurate and, and you know, careful information about how our students were doing, what the major questions were that they had, uh, when we were answering those questions effectively and when we weren't, uh, so that we could really modify that message, and also letting us know when uh, we needed to have town halls. So we did not schedule those in a regular fashion. We did them um, as big decisions were coming up or as we felt information was needed, or when the students told us, you better go ahead and do uh, that town hall. And that was really, I think, very, very helpful. We also relied on our uh, Office of Student Counseling and other uh, faculty members to let us know when they were hearing from students about things that we needed to address. Uh, I think the other um, aspects was thinking about our faculty. So a lot of our faculty, course directors and clerkship directors were really thrust into new roles that they hadn't uh, been in before. They also were oftentimes taking care of patients in the hospital and trying to balance that with other uh, activities. We're really fortunate that we had just created an office uh, of educational innovations run by Helen Rim and two colleagues, uh, Nancy uh, Corchado and Vanessa Wright. And they were really quickly able to uh, move into uh, their, their roles, get our faculty up and running with uh, Zoom technologies and other virtual technologies, uh, work with me and others to help create online modules when there weren't uh, any before. And this was incredibly valuable for our faculty and students during that time frame. We also, uh, I wanna mention my senior associate dean, Josh Nazanchuk, we ended up meeting with all of our clerkships uh, directors individually to really talk through their plans, um, help them along with, with different aspects of responding to the, uh, the crisis and providing good virtual education when we were, did have to make the difficult decision to pull students uh, from clinical education. I also didn't wanna neglect our staff. We had a number of meetings with staff members to address their concerns, which were significant and really helped us understand um, how a variety of our members were thinking about all the challenges they were facing. And I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, Joe? Sure, thanks. So um, again, uh, I think the issue of building on the existing strengths is, uh, is important. We, uh, uh, the, the, the Vice Dean's Cabinet, we're very lucky in that um, we've been working together for a while and we really do feel uh, professionally comfortable with each other. So um, the concerns that were being managed in areas like admissions or financial aid uh, or student affairs um, were shared and we were able to cast a, a, a pretty wide net uh, in terms of soliciting information and, and, and bringing it kind of up the ladder as necessary. Um, we lagged a little bit in um, uh, organizing information flow from students, um, though we, uh, uh, similarly to what um, Einstein mentioned, we built on the structure of the existing elected uh, student presidents and vice presidents, and later went to full uh, uh, town halls with each class. Um, so I think uh, casting a wide net, feeling comfortable with each other, and um, also trying to adapt as quickly as, as possible. Um, uh, last week, for example, we began um, to take some baby steps in moving students into clinical environments. This was some of the advanced, the rising fourth year students uh, in terms of sub-internships. Um, and uh, we were a day or two in, I got a text from the Dean of Students saying, oh God, there's a curfew. Um, we, you better be okay with uh, travel reimbursement for students uh, in contra, uh, in, you know, in uh, 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 different from the usual uh, university uh, policies and procedures. And um, we didn't pause for a moment in deciding that we were absolutely gonna go ahead with that. Um, so I think uh, in real time, assessing problems as they come up and being able to pivot has really, I guess, been the theme of the last three months for, uh, for all of us and, and probably all of you as well. Thanks, Joe. Carol? So I don't wanna be too long-winded and repeat much of what everyone else already said, 
Um, but suffice it to say that assessing the needs in the moment was and continues to be an ongoing challenge for us as well at the Zucker School of Medicine as information is changing daily. And in some ways it is more challenging to communicate in the remote environment we find ourselves in today. Um, so we tackled this challenge in two major ways. First, um, we sought to ensure broad representation on our planning teams and subcommittees so that each member could monitor their particular areas and report back to the group regularly. And second, um, we really we tried to establish bilateral communication with students, faculty, and staff through emails, virtual town halls, and also through the many existing meetings and reporting structures that we already had in place. Lastly, I just wanted to note that the executive planning team in charge of the school's response is a subset of the larger, more diverse group of leaders that forms the Dean's Cabinet, which continues to meet every two weeks. So the Dean's Cabinet meetings are an additional point in time, twice per month, where important information can be shared and decisions can be discussed with representation from all areas of the school. Thanks, Carol. I'm gonna go on to the next question. Joe? Sure, thanks. So uh, when I was asked about this question, I thought back about um, 60 days, it of course <clears throat> feels like three years, um, again, which is probably true for everyone here. So um, a bunch of things had to be decided very quickly. And I think um, most of the panelists and the, uh, the people who are participating in this probably went through a very similar sequence. Um, we had to very quickly uh, remove our students who, have, who were in clinical training. Um, and obviously, you know, for the fourth year students, this was all post-match. So um, it was, a, it was a, almost a non-issue for them. Um, and for the first year students who hadn't begun clerkships, it was also a non-issue. But it was a significant impact on the second and third year students. Um, the second year students, because we begin clerkships uh, uh, in, the, uh, in January, were literally just uh, getting their first sense of what uh, being a doctor in a clinical setting was like. So that was extremely disruptive. And similarly for the third year students who were beginning to think about specialization and um, this kind of front end of the match, um, uh, it was extremely disruptive. Our students very quickly formed a volunteer group called uh, CSSC, um, the Columbia Students uh, Support uh, Community um, for COVID, um, who uh, created a, an amazingly uh, quickly formed organization of volunteer support, um, particularly utilizing a lot of the students who had been in clinical settings. This is with telemedicine and um, tutoring for neighborhood students, all kinds of terrific stuff. Um, the residence halls, of course, closed, and we had to very quickly deal with uh, students who were being uh, who had to pack up and leave. Um, we moved to remote teaching for the first years, uh, and that was um, um, not as as disruptive as it might have been, because so much of our first year teaching uh, already of the fundamentals teaching already included uh, some kind of an online component in terms of flipped classes and stuff like that, recorded, recorded lectures. Um, we, like a lot of the schools, had to uh, move toward early graduation for those fourth year students uh, and arrange with Presbyter uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital for uh, special placements for them. Um, we had to pivot to a, uh, an in-person revisit uh, for admissions uh, for the newly admitted uh, uh, students in the incoming first year class. Um, that was basically the first two weeks, I think, everything, everything that I just mentioned. Um, and of course, very importantly in the last month, um, dealing with uh, communications and support resources for both students and staff uh, in the days since the George Floyd killing and the subsequent uh, subsequent events and conversations, um, which has now increasingly in the last uh, two or three weeks um, become the kind of crisis within the crisis that has uh, uh, required a, a lot of, uh, of outreach and communication and support. Um, an interesting 60 days. Thanks, Joe. Carol? So um, along with all the other schools, we had to make many decisions in a short period of time. 
sometimes under great uncertainty about the future. And we recognize that we will need to continue monitoring new information and making decisions for months to come. Um, I just wanted to break down my answer into two sections. Um, major decisions as we were preparing for Hofstra's eventual closure, and then also um, decisions in more recent times as we were preparing to return to our medical education facility. So um, as we prepared for the campus closure and the closure of our medical school facility, we really focused on two major decisions. One was how best to train faculty and staff to work and teach remotely by ensuring everyone had access to and training on the IT resources that were available to support this transition. And because of the unique way our curriculum is structured, we had the added challenge of figuring out how to conduct active small group case-based learning in a remote environment um, with very little advance notice. Um, and then, you know, like, like Joe was mentioning, you know, we also had to make the decision to pull our students out of the clinical setting while the hospitals were in a state of chaos and being overwhelmed with new coronavirus cases, um, which then caused us to need to determine how best to ensure that these students could remain on track to graduate through non-clinical electives and other non-clinical required coursework as they were not able to complete their clinical rotations as we had originally planned. Um, and over the past few months following the closure of our education facility, we've been focusing on um, three major things. One is keeping a close watch on our budget, both unspent funds for things like travel and events that were canceled, as well as unexpected expenses, such as remote teaching technology and remote proctoring services. Second, we've spent some time really figuring out how to keep all our employees whole in their current positions, because not every role lends itself to remote work. Um, but because of our flexibility in this regard, we have completely avoided staffing cuts to date at the medical school. Um, and lastly, you know, more recently, we made the difficult to de decision to convert our admissions interview process to a virtual process this upcoming year. Um, so that's, those are just a few things that we've been, we've been thinking about. Thanks, Carol. Einstein team? Thank you, Michelle. So just for you know, this, it's really remarkable, the similarities between uh, all of the schools uh, in the middle of this. And I don't want to um, repeat what Joe and Carol so eloquently talked about. I'll answer the question a little bit differently um, in terms of how our medical students interfaced with our hospital system. And just give you some background on how we addressed the surge and what we did in the first 60 days. Uh, the staffing model was such that we always wanted an internal medicine doctor to be supervising the team. And we built our teams, uh, Dr. Will Southern was very involved, our chief hospitalist, uh, was extremely involved in creating this really nice staffing model. And how do we get our medical students to interface with those models uh, was sort of based upon the model of a sub-intern. And the ACGME has lots of different rules and regulations about graduating uh, medical students and having them join. There's certain things they can do and can't do, and, and there was all sorts of uh, questions about what that was. So we eventually ended up taking our medical students and having them join our existing uh, teams, sort of at the level of a sub I, where they could round with the team and they were part of that structure that they were used to as third and fourth years. But on top of it, they were able to flex between uh, different sites and do different things. Uh, we didn't have any of our medical students join our ICU teams. Our ICUs were primarily, uh, in our staffing model, we use general surgery, anesthesia, critical care, of course, and internal medicine. And our med search floors were largely staffed by um, one internal medicine doctor and then um, a series of what we called allied doctors, which uh, Dr. Kathy Skay, our DIO, was uh, an incredible resource to help put together, along with uh, some, others, some other people on the team. Uh, Anna Manka and myself uh, were the others. And what we really tried to do was, was mimic the teams that the medical students sort of were used to, uh, you know, an attending, uh, a PGY three or four, and then, or two or three, sorry, and then an intern, and then a medical student. And we had them interface with the team at a slightly higher level than they would have as just a third or fourth year student. Um, I'll let Dr. Cassis take over for the, for the what that felt like from the uh, medical education perspective. Uh, I'm gonna mention two things and keep it relatively brief. One that both I think are relatively unique to our experience. Um, as you might know, Einstein has a long tradition that's uh, very spiritual and religious, particularly in, uh, for those from Jewish backgrounds, uh, but also uh, an increasing number of uh, students uh, from a Muslim background. So one of the challenges we had was very early on in this pandemic, we had a graduate of Einstein who was part of the, the Jewish community 
who tested positive for the disease and had been uh, present in our, uh, our uh, synagogue on campus. So the decision to close that space and close the prayer space for our uh, Muslim students was an incredibly challenging decision and one that we made in concert with uh, the individuals in those communities. And I want to really call out our Office of Student Affairs, Allison Ludwig in particular, who did a great job interfacing uh, with, with uh, those individuals. But it was a really uh, major uh, challenge for us and continues to be. Uh, I although I think those groups have done an amazing job responding to that and being adaptable um, as well. The other uh, big challenge that has been mentioned, but I, I think we have a slightly different frame on it, Pulling our students from clinical education was one of the biggest uh, heartbreaking moments for me during this pandemic. Not something I ever thought I would have to do as an educator or administrator, but actually equally as hard and maybe more so was a decision we made very soon after that to allow uh, certain select uh, fourth year medical students to re-enter the clinical environment as volunteers. And we did that in a very unique situation. We were expanding our clinical hospital to our pediatric uh, center, so our cha children's hospital at Montefiore, they were gonna have a staffing model with pediatric attendings and pediatric house staff uh, caring for adult patients in the pediatric hospital. And uh, we were able to work very closely with um, Miriam Schechter, who's our pediatric cookship director, Helen Rim, who I mentioned earlier, and Rhonda Ashlanu, our vice chair for pediatrics education, um, to be able to match our phenomenal top-notch uh, graduates uh, with these teams to really care for adult patients and to leverage shared knowledge um, and experience. And I, I think it was one of the shining uh, lights we had uh, in connecting our students, our medical school uh, with the health system. And I'm really proud of, of all the work that our students, graduates did and that uh, these amazing medical educators did as well. Thanks, Todd. Uh, at Icon School of Medicine, uh, I won't repeat some of what was already said by my colleagues, but the, a few of the major decisions that we had to face or significant decisions that we had to face had to do with not closing the residence dorm. We have uh, a, a large number of students who uh, are in the deferred action status. We have some students who um, really have unstable housing outside of their um, housing here on campus, and we felt it was really important not to close down the residence housing. So we kept the dorms open, and our student that allowed our students to mobilize quickly into their COVID response task force and really create their volunteer workforce can seamlessly as as folks were still here. Many people were looking to help in in the institution, and that was a really big decision that we made as a unit. The other major decision. We, because of the, the close link to our education and our clinical environment at, at Mount Sinai, um, we, were losing, um, we were losing money dramatically. And so we uh, ended up having to redeploy some of our school employees into the hospital environment. Folks who were uh, curriculum coordinators or project managers in the education environment actually went to work in materials management on the wards being runners, handing out PPE, managing inventory, working in the laundry, really as the entire health system and the entire Mount Sinai um, hospital on, on the campus where the school is, really was um, stretched to its capacity. As, as most of you know, we ended up converting our lobby into patient wards. We ended up setting up a tent in partnership with an external organization to care for COVID positive patients in Central Park. Um, we, so we really, uh, as, an, as an organization, we are very linked to our hospital. We, we co-share the, the campus. And so our teams mobilized across the health system. So that was a really big decision that we ended up having to make that had a significant impact. And finally, we had to lay some folk off. And so thank goodness New York State implemented what was called a shared, what is called a shared work program where um, it's basically part-time unemployment. And so it was really um, a significant move both financially and in order to keep some of our staff uh, whole, we were able to take advantage of um, reducing some effort on some of our staffing and allowing them to recoup um, a percentage of their salary from the New York State Department of Labor. Carol? All right, so uh, the next question is, what are you considering now 
and what are the things you're grappling with to prepare for what comes next? Um, so to start off my answer, I just wanted to say that um, our clinical training areas are within Northwell Health. And so as of June 1st, our rising fourth year students um, return to the clinical setting. And uh, we plan for our, our rising third year students to return um, soon in July. And, um, th but the greatest challenge we're grappling with at the moment is, is really our wish to um, provide as many in-person learning experiences as is safely allowable for both our incoming first year students and our rising second year students. And uh, we of course plan to reopen our medical education facility under the guidance of the CDC and the New York State Governor's Office, but we're still working on determining our timeline and the relative mix of in-person versus virtual curricular delivery methods, and really to figure out our staffing model for which people we would need to be on site to support those efforts. Um, we're facing many other challenges and considerations, and I couldn't possibly mention them all, but just to mention three. Um, first, our medical school is located on Hofstra University's campus. So we're navigating the guidelines that institutes of higher education have to follow, as well as those that are more specific to healthcare training programs and hospitals. Second, we're working with our planning teams to develop an educational campaign and appropriate training for students, faculty, and staff on all of our new policies and protocols in order to transition back to in-person activities in our medical education facility in the safest way possible. And third, um, we expect ongoing challenges with obtaining the PPE and cleaning supplies we need to reopen and stay open in our medical education facility for in-person activities. Thanks, Carol. Einstein team? Sure, thank you, Michelle. So yeah, again, a lot of similarities. I won't repeat uh, some of the things that Carol uh, mentioned here, but we'll take a slightly different approach to mention a couple different things that uh, we managed um, on, on our team, which I'm sure is similar to others. Uh, Carol mentioned PPE, and this is a really major one. Um, I don't think anyone really understood the scope of PPE that was needed and how quickly we would be going through it based on the size of our teams, where, you know, one of the lessons learned is, you know, how many patients are, you know, based on the number of patients, how many people need to be going in the rooms? Can we limit the number of PPE used? Um, one of the major things that, uh, that really was striking to me and remains is we're doing a lot of surveys about emotional response and anxiety and stress. I don't think anyone really understood the scope or magnitude of what that is. A lot of that actually comes from feeling unsafe. And so not having adequate PD or not knowing that you will when you get there, despite our incredible resources and stores, you know, we're going through it very quickly. And so uh, one of the things we're thinking about doing for the future is trying to get our students the PP before they even get to their clerkship. So they have it, they feel comfortable, they know how to use it before they even show up. And, and now that we have a little bit of a lull, we have that luxury. So we're trying things along those lines. Uh, you know, we increased the number of scrubs so people could change more often. That was a major thing uh, that was really important, uh, not only for the students, but also for the residents uh, and faculty. And then having psychiatry uh, really on board. We have a, a wonderful department that's really reached out, uh, not only in caregiver support network, but having one-to-one -one therapists, 24-7 um, being able to access somebody um, and then having people on site to help students and residents deal with the emotions of what they're seeing, uh, which is really uh, quite dramatic uh, when, when you see these floors. Uh, I'll let Dr. Francis go from there. Thanks, Anurag. I'll just talk briefly about our clinical education and then our pre-clerkship uh, uh, thoughts and just mention a couple of them. There are many and Carol did a great job of, of summarizing a lot of those. For the clinical side, we are welcoming back about a third of our class to the clinical environment at the end of this month. And I think it's actually worked out quite well. We did that uh, scaled model because we allowed some students to continue to study for and take step one prior to entering year three. And we allowed other students who wanted to really focus on volunteering and not uh, studying for step one to delay step one until after third year. So that group will be that's delaying step one will start uh, third year at the end of this month. And they're really gonna be uh, helping us understand what's working and what's not working. It's allowed our clerkship directors and our other um, administrators to really think about what is it that we need to know in order to feel safe and, uh, that students are coming back. Um, and and uh, a lot of questions that are arising in an exponential fashion uh, for us to address and working closely with Anurag uh, has been fantastic in that regard. On the undergraduate medical education side, we actually uh, have been wandering our spaces and uh, actually with our environmental health safety group, which has created 
minimum or maximum uh, capacities for different uh, space educational spaces. And what that showed us is that we needed to have a more hybrid approach to our return. We want to be live and in person as much as possible, uh, particularly for small group active learning sessions. But we foresee probably the need to have about half of our class do that live and in person uh, while facilitating uh, social distancing and PPE use, and the other half really focusing on that activity uh, virtually. And so we're putting into a place that type of, a, of an approach, which will be an interesting thing to see. As we prepare for that, we've actually been uh, running, we're about to start running a series of focus groups with our first year students who just finished, uh, who had the longest virtual education that we've had at Einstein, to really learn about what went well and what didn't, and how we can pivot to actually do that better. Because I think in our future, we foresee um, continuing with virtual education and really taking the best of, of what we learned from that um, and implementing that in our, in our future curriculum. Um, I'll stop there and, and move on, let you move on to the next person. So uh, very similar parallels, I think. We, uh, our, first, our, our, our first year residence hall uh, is an old fashioned uh, dorm with uh, shared bathrooms. So uh, as opposed to the apartment layouts for the upperclassmen. Um, so um, we just recently let our incoming class know that the fall semester was going to be done entirely uh, remotely. Um, so that has meant that we have had to um, think through uh, the ramifications of remote instruction, specifically for the first semester, uh, for uh, uh, obviously for classes like gross anatomy and uh, some of the seminars that were um, had been in the past been face-to-face -face classes. Um, uh, so that was sort of the first and immediate challenge. Uh, as far as the clerkships are concerned, this has already been mentioned, the issue of PPE, of uh, uh, travel issues uh, for the various clinical settings um, is obviously the, uh, the other thing that's now got to be considered given that uh, the fall will probably be different um, than it had been in the past. Um, I'm responsible for human resources within education, so we've also had to think about the administrative staff and um, how to implement social distancing uh, and the potential for testing requirements in office spaces, as well as physical changes to office spaces that we may have to implement. Um, uh, and then uh, the budget ramifications of all of the above, um, in particular, uh, uh, the question of financial aid for both um, new and continuing students, given the um, the changes uh, in families' uh, financial backgrounds, um, in endowment uh, 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 investment returns, and all of those sort of secondary um, budget impacts that are, uh, uh, that are being um, thought through now for next year. Our final question has to do with communications. How did you create your communications plan for faculty, staff, and students? For us at ICON, we had meetings uh, in the first month. We had town halls twice a week for all students. In the second month, we slowed that down and did one week, uh, every class, every week. Um, so we had scholarly year students as well and separate uh, sessions for each cohort. We sent out daily digests to all medical students, um, ensuring that everyone, in fact, frankly, all graduate students as well, um, ensuring that everyone had up-to-date information on policies and changes. Things were changing so rapidly in that environment that we really wanted to have a daily bilateral communication with students. Um, we also communicated to our uh, greater med medical education faculty and staff. Um, we had meetings with the course directors, the assessment teams, all of the GME teams and support staff. Um, we had uh, town hall meetings with the, with the entire department every two weeks for the first month. Most divisions within medical education, curricular affairs, student affairs, um, assessment met um, on a daily basis and sometimes by bi weekly basis. Um, we sent out weekly email updates to the entire department, um, making sure to recognize that people were suffering, making sure to highlight the fact that this wasn't happening to other people. We weren't just the caregivers or the educators trying to grapple with how do we keep the, the ship afloat. We were also um, connected to the communities that were being impacted. Many of us law, had loss. 
Um, and so we were dealing, making sure that folks had the resources that they needed to deal with that loss. Um, the other piece was, had to do with how we made sure that folks stayed connected to each other. Working remotely was a very different paradigm. Um, the work of medical education, those of you in this industry know, it is, is a collective environment. Um, you vibe off of your peers and colleagues um, and, you, and you get excited by the energy that that poses and being separated um, amidst this pandemic was, was really quite difficult. And so we created um, in our department um, a program called All In Together, where we made sure that we connected with staff and faculty throughout the department. We made sure that we, heard, we had bi-directional feedback mechanisms. We created small chats and energizing sessions where people would show, you know, how to make great macaroni and cheese or how to plant, how to start a vegetable garden or, you know, live DJ set with some of, uh, some of your favorite uh, faculty. Um, and so we really thought it was important uh, to allow the space for folks to come together and, and to be united in all of this um, pain and suffering around us and to really rejoice in the great work that we were doing. Carol? Thanks, Michelle. Um, so, I mean, we've really built off of the many existing communication structures we have in place already to ensure appropriate communication throughout these changing conditions over the past several months. Um, our communication with students entails a combination of regular emails to each class and weekly or semi-monthly virtual town halls to address their questions and concerns. Uh, our Office of Student Affairs also created a website of COVID-related resources and wellness support for students. In terms of our communication with faculty and staff, it's mostly relied on weekly emails and existing meetings and reporting structures, but we did have one virtual town hall for faculty and staff um, as we were preparing to uh, close our building. And we have another one coming up next week to start the process of addressing our transition back into the medical education facility. I assume it won't, it'll be uh, the first of many town halls as we, as we prepare to transition back. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to mention that in terms of communications, our communications team is working on creating a uniquely branded look for our upcoming education campaign that we're planning to launch very soon to bring all of our faculty, staff, and students up to speed on new protocols as we transition back to in-person activities. Thanks, Carol. Einstein team? Thank you, Michelle. Uh, listening to both of you, I'm really, uh, really awed by all you were able to do with your communication. I think we uh, probably did not uh, do it the way that you did or, or couldn't have, and I wish we, we would have been able to do as much as you did. Um, I think our main thrust with communications was really trying to prioritize individuals who were really being struck by this, either through uh, direct physical health. We had uh, many students who ended up contracting the infection, and I think we had a lot of individual communication with those individuals to make sure they were getting what they needed, whether it was food or, or access to healthcare. Um, similarly with staff and faculty and trying to be very proactive about that part of it, um, which, was, which was really uh, sad and challenging for all of us. Um, our major way of communicating with students, I think, was through our virtual town halls. And I mentioned town halls previously, I should mention they were all virtual. Um, and we usually had several students that did join us live and they would facilitate the question and answer part of that uh, virtual town hall and direct questions to us that they thought would impact the most number of students. But one of the things I'm most uh, you know, proud of on our end is that uh, whenever, those Q &A, whenever those town halls ended, because they had to end eventually, they could have gone on for many, many hours, maybe days, uh, because there were so many questions that needed answering, that um, we always made it a point to take whatever additional questions came through on the chat or on the Q&A in addition, allowing the, the class reps to gather additional questions that might have been generated by the event, and then getting those, those students' answers back electronically, uh, usually within 24 or 48 hours, sometimes a little longer. And that was a really pretty Herculean task in the middle of all, all this stuff. And I, I wanna, again, thank our uh, many people who really made that, that possible. Uh, it, this is challenging. I think communications was definitely one of our biggest challenges throughout this um, experience. We knew what we were trying to do. We thought we had the right stakeholders uh, in place, but making sure that everyone knew exactly what we were doing and why was not always uh, as straightforward. We, were, we really relied. We have an amazing communications uh, group here at Einstein, 
And they worked with us initially on most of our high stakes communication. They also did a really phenomenal job of revamping the website for both public and private use so that um, accurate information, factual information was made available. We also, I think one of the key things that was, that was on everybody's minds was trying to get a sense of what the impact was uh, for, um, you know, for our health system. And eventually we were able to get our, our CEO, uh, I think, it, and it was a really phenomenal thing that he did, to post daily census uh, values for our patients who were admitted in our health system with COVID. And once that was available, I think people really started to have an understanding of what was happening and where, why our focus wasn't always on certain uh, things that, that you know, they may have wanted answered. It really made it clear that we had a crisis and all hands were on deck for that crisis. So I think that's, that's what I'll, I'll stop there and turn it over to Anurag. Thanks, Ted. I, you know, I don't really have a whole lot to add to that. That was really comprehensive. I'll just highlight one thing. This is a really emotional disease. Uh, patients can't talk to their family members often. And, you know, our ability to speak to our students and residents, we have to always keep in mind what they're going through. It's very traumatic. And the more you can do, um, you know, in person, virtually, et cetera, is, is probably better than emails and letters, uh, which can often be taken a, you know, a different way than you expect because, you know, we don't know how anyone's feeling pretty traumatic uh, what everyone is going through and, and has went through. So uh, and during your communications, just keep in mind uh, that fact that a voice and a face can go a long way. That's all I have. Thanks. And Joe? Uh, very similar experiences. I think we were probably um, so tied up with the here and now during the first month um, that uh, uh, a broad communication got a little bit of short shrift. Um, in terms of the students, again, I said after that first month, we have been doing uh, uh, virtual town halls for each of the classes, um, either weekly or bi-weekly, depending on the class, and uh, also meeting bi-weekly with the student leadership of those classes. Um, with the staff, uh, uh, for the uh, full staff within education, um, it took a little while to get it up and running. And um, we've been doing biweekly meetings. We've also been talking about um, splitting up groups into smaller groups, either um, uh, particular challenging issues that staff are trying to deal with, including things like uh, uh, dealing with uh, education, school, school age kids at home, or being caregivers. Um, to you know, more fun groups like uh, yoga or uh, uh, some online cooking um, to basically both build communication and have structures to uh, to get the word out. Um, it's important. I'm, I'm I'm almost at the point where I would say that there's no such thing as not enough communication. Um, but as time consuming and as um, uh, just uh, energy consuming as it is, it's important to really try to keep that end up as well. Thank you so, so much to our roundtable panelists. This was very enlightening. I appreciate your vulnerability and the fact that you're sharing um, what we hope will be pearls of wisdom for you uh, who are in attendance in this. Um, we, as you all know, we are not done. This pandemic continues to ravage our, con our country. Um, and so, what we want you to know is that we're here. You have our, uh, our names and our information. Reach out to us. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. We see the data around the country of the staggering rates that some states are now experiencing an increase in COVID positive patients. Hospitals being um, maxed out to capacity reach out to us. We have just survived. In fact, we are still surviving in this environment and we're here for you. So this is a, is a collective effort. We all have to really lock arms in this work and um, we open the floor now for your questions. I encourage you to type in your questions. You can click the thumbs up button to what we call upvote so that we can see which questions garner the most interest. Uh, first question we'll send to Carol. Um, so which am I, do, I? I'm going to answer the one that um, actually needs an answer, which is so far what has been the most expected hurdle, um, what most unexpected operational hurdle. Um, gosh, it's hard to answer. I feel like 
everything that has happened has been unexpected. Um, you know, if I had to choose one thing, I feel like, you know, one of the things we're still grappling with is we still don't fully understand the long-term effect of, um, of the current health crisis on our budget. It feels like this is just the beginning of a completely shifted model that probably may never go back to the way it was. And, um, and so I think we're, we're very much still grappling with that. And, and it feels like there's, there's a lot of uncertainty in the future in terms of the financing. Thanks, Carol. Joe, do you want to take the next one? What? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be brave. I'll take it. So um, look, uh, we are all, uh, 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 you know, administrators, and I know sometimes that's a pejorative, but uh, we are professionals, and we've dealt with floods and hurricanes and strikes and all kinds of stuff that keeps us away from our regular day jobs at some point in our career. And um, this is this is uh, a hurricane and a strike uh, and a flood and a blizzard on steroids. Obviously, it's uh, unique and we don't have a lot of historical precedent for it. And we try to structure our day in such a way that we can get to all of the stuff that's being flung at us. And at the same time to uh, make time for ourselves and for our, our families and our loved ones. I think the important sort of um, second level implication of that question is um, uh, to be careful about uh, staff who are being stressed out, who are being overloaded, um, be conscious of whatever supports might be available in your school or in your university for them, um, and to make sure that while everybody is trying to squeeze, you know, 27 or 28 hours every out of every day, um, that they understand that there are, uh, you know, some pitfalls, some dangers, some risks to that, and um, uh, uh, that, uh, you know, you, we talked about communication, that you try to stay in touch with your staff and make sure that they are uh, feeling supportive uh, as they work very, very hard um, in this, uh, in this, uh, this uh, certainly historical set of circumstances that we've been dealt with. Thanks, Joe. Anurag, do you want to answer what one thing would you have done differently? It's difficult to choose. Uh, so many things happen, but you know, I'll answer it this way. I think if we were able to communicate, sort of an amalgam of whatever else has said uh, for the other questions, but if we were able to communicate a priori with our students and residents about what they were about to experience, provided them with resources about a lot of the clinical decisions they'd have to make, um, and then provide them with an understanding that we're gonna keep them safe and be able to provide those resources, all beforehand. Um, obviously, it wasn't possible to do that. But if I had to do it over again, I think taking away some of the uncertainty in any way possible would have been one of the most meaningful things we could do. It's a tough situation, as Joe mentioned eloquently, and I'm not going to yeah. add any to that. It, it was on steroids and, and powerful ones at that. So I think just getting rid of some of the emotion and uncertainty would have been uh, something we would have really, really benefited from and, and hopefully will. Uh, if and when the next one happens. Thanks. I'll take this one. How did you handle the remote work with staff? Uh, that was complicated. We uh, were not designed for that. Uh, we really didn't have a staff work remote policy and therefore folks did not have access to desktops. Everybody wasn't on VPN. So our IT team mobilized quick, fast, in a hurry and really created a process where we checked out um, the, the laptops that we used for shelf exams, and we distributed them to our staff, set them up with their remote VPN access, and um, really mobilized a team to support the IT setup and to ensure that folks were feeling safe in where they were and ways for us to communicate. We started, we, um, started uh, using different communication tools. We started with a tool called Slack that allowed folks, uh, uh, teams to communicate with each other. And so that was a pretty, that was a pretty big lift. That was uh, one of the more difficult things to mobilize um, to ensure that folks could stay connected and stay actively working. Todd, do you wanna take the 
uh, faculty instructors who are reluctant to do face-to-face -face instruction? Sure, I can't see the whole question. Let me pull it over here. How will you handle faculty instructors' reluctance to do face-to-face -face instruction in fall because they're fearful of the risks or in a higher risk category? Yeah, happy to address that question. I think um, we have not heard a lot of individuals who've expressed that reluctance at this point yet. Um, I think the bigger issue that we've been thinking proactively about is those in higher risk categories, those who are um, at higher risk for the, the uh, COVID-19 disease either because of age um, or because of underlying health conditions. And as I mentioned earlier, we really are thinking of a more hybrid return um, where, where uh, some percentage of the class will do things live and some will do those things uh, virtually. And again, that may depend a little bit on who the facilitator of that session is and um, what, their, what their risk profile is. And same thing with the students. We're gonna have to keep that in mind as well. Our students are also in high risk groups at times. and. Um, so I think that that's definitely something that we're, we're thinking actively about. Um, but o overall, we have not heard that uh, from our faculty. I think our faculty are eager to have students back and to, uh, to work with them. Uh, certainly in our clinical environment, I think we, uh, we, we want to monitor that we're doing it safely. So we're really encouraging the use of PPE, even in, in, you know, when they're not in with patients, that we're really using these social distancing tools uh, appropriately when we're in the healthcare setting. And we also will use those in small group settings um, when we return uh, in August for with our pre clerkship uh, folks. Joe, do you want to take uh, the next question? Staff are often thought of. Yes, I'm unmuted. So, uh, yeah, I mentioned that uh, it is important to uh, the care and feeding of the staff. I think the implication of the question is absolutely correct that very often they are kind of um, lost in the shuffle. Um, and I mentioned it, uh, having, um, first of all, we identified whatever support resources the university was rolling out uh, for faculty and students. Um, in particular, our psychiatry department um, uh, very early on began to put together uh, uh, an array of clinical services, one-on-ones um, -on or group sessions. And um, uh, they were uh, at first making that service, those services available for faculty and students. And a number of us mentioned to them that it would be appropriate to extend that to staff as well. And they immediately agreed. There are other kinds of offices, um, uh, uh, Office of Work Life and uh, Human Resources um, that are out there. So I've been, we've been trying to make sure that um, the staff understand that there are formal services and offices available to support them. And as, we, as we've already said also, just in terms of communication, making sure that staff are not forgotten if you're doing some kind of uh, periodic email blast of, to update people on facts and information, um, whatever events are happening online um, or virtually, you know, we went through this with white coat, with, com with uh, uh, the match, with commencement, um, to make sure that the staff are invited to those as well uh, just so that, um, you know, they're not overlooked and neglected, uh, uh, given everything that's going on. Thank you. Carol, do you want to take the next one? Sure. Uh, the question is, our students felt cheated out of teaching when we switched online. Are you adjusting tuition or fees if online is the need for the fall? Uh, it's a great question, and I'd be interested to know um, what the answers are from the other panelists. Um, we are not planning to adjust our tuition or fees uh, for the fall, but we are planning to be in person as much as possible. Um, even in the virtual model, um, we, we made a commitment, you know, our faculty made a commitment not to compromise our guiding principles of active small group learning. And so we have done our best to continue that type of learning model, even in the virtual setting, um, so as not to compromise the quality of the education. Thanks, we did, we are doing the same. Um, we did not re reduce our tuition or fees. And we are also um, having a hybrid uh, first semester for incoming students and, and, and returning second year students. So there will be some required um, in-person sessions as well as virtual sessions. Joe? 
Yeah, right. so um, this was, question? yeah, this was, um, this issue was handed to me. So I had to become the bad guy vis-a-vis -vis the students. Um, but uh, the good news is I and the staff used it as an opportunity to uh, do a little bit of uh, medical school finances 101 for the students. Um, we've done presentations like that before in the past for faculty. Um, and that's to remind students how at a, uh, a major uh, research-based medical center with a huge clinical component, um, tuition is a relatively small piece of the overall picture. And in fact, um, uh, the students were benefiting from uh, uh, the larger budget uh, the larger budget picture and that like at most educational institutions the resources mostly went to people um, you know there was the misconception that uh, if there aren't any in-class classes then we don't need to copy syllabi anymore not that anybody does that so um, they were sure that with uh, paper and travel being cut back that could manifest itself in savings that could result in some kind of tuition credit um, so, uh, you know, when life gives you lemons, uh, because we um, uh, were challenged about some of this, we did use it as a learning moment uh, to give people a bigger, a sense of the bigger financial picture. And um, I got a little bit of feedback from some of the students who said that it was uh, uh, enlightening and helpful uh, in, in uh, letting them at least understand the bigger uh, picture and the and the uh, the overall ramifications of what a tuition reduction or credit would uh, what the impact would be. Thank thanks. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna ask one last question, Anurag. I'd like for you to take uh, how do you reopen and yet keep mindful of resurgence? Um, sure. So. What we're looking at right now in terms of reopening is, is phased, as others have said. So, you know, how many students can we have in a classroom? Looking at the, the size of our auditoriums, how many feet apart can we be? A lot of that data is really critical to have, and, and that's something anybody could do now. You can kind of imagine how big your classrooms are and, you know, what you can get out of the resources that you already have. Uh, you know, investing in online resources and tools and, and things like that and, and creating a hybrid model is a, is a critical part that everyone's been doing already. Um, that's really the biggest thing we're doing. The PPE obviously is, of course, a, a major concern. And we're, we're maintaining our social distancing at the GME and UME levels to the best of our ability. But, you know, the, the, the harsh reality of this is that as we do reopen, uh, as New York City reopens, as the rest of the country has, has largely reopened, um, and much of our state has reopened, you know, keeping the distances and keeping all the, the necessary um, requirements is challenging. And trying to do it mindfully is the best we can do, the try part. What we can't do is stop what happens in the community. You know, we can't stop uh, the different phases of reopening from graduating faster than they can. So I think the, the thing we have to be mindful of is, is looking at the resources that, that you have uh, and that we have in our case and saying, what, what's the maximum we can do? And just really doing a lot of planning uh, and just be as mindful of that portion. The rest of it is very challenging to control. So you sort of control what you can and, um, and you hope for the best. Uh, but planning resources, PPE, and um, you know, the classroom sizes can all be done um, you know, very intelligently and mindfully. Thank you so much. Please, a big thank you to all of our panelists our roundtable discussion I thought was very rich and informative. I hope you as attendees really got out of it what you participate, what you hope to get out by participating. Um, also know that we are here, as I mentioned before, um, we wanted to share this information. We, we came together with all of the New York Metro schools so that we could provide a resource for you so that we could share and enlighten folks in other parts of the nation who may be soon to experience some of what we had to go through. Um, it has been a, a, a team building exercise. Many of us have come together in a different way because we have been through this, this traumatic event. And again, um, reminding folks that we ourselves have been impacted. Uh, Todd from Einstein uh, mentioned that many of our students 
got sick in, in, in all of this. Many of our faculty uh, were sick in all of this. And, um, you know, in, in the recent weeks, as we're still kind of grappling with the, the recovery and contingency planning to have um, the, the, the violence portrayed against black bodies, black and brown bodies in this nation come to a fever pitch and, uh, and having to manage um, protests and, you know, um, COVID and how to keep ourselves safe, how to have our voices heard, how to protect our students and keep their voice, them safe and their voices heard has been a real challenge. Um, so we thank you for joining us. Um, uh, thank you so much for taking time out and please know that we're here um, and we hope to be able to share and support you as we continue to work through the ravages of COVID-19 um, and this pandemic. Thank you so much.